Shalom, everyone. My name is Tony Pino, and I am here with a good friend of mine, Steve Franklin. And uh, today we are going to watch a video, which is a video done by an Orthodox Jew. His name is Dr. Hillel Abramson. He's pretty famous. He's a great historian, and he does a lot of videos on the history of the Jewish people, history of Christianity, and so forth. And he is doing it from an Orthodox Jewish perspective. So we did pick this video that we want to walk you through and show you because he is particularly um, going to give you his thoughts and opinions about Paul, you know, the, the uh, Paul of the Bible, right, Shaul. And we found it very interesting when we watched this video, um, his thoughts, and basically we found his thoughts kind of line up with a lot of Orthodox Jews that we come across. And so we feel he's a good representation of the way a lot of Jews who are not followers of Yeshua have that this type of outlook of who Paul was and how the Bible expresses who Paul was. So we want to go ahead and walk you through his video to show you how we think he's got it right. And in certain areas, we think he hasn't, you know, exactly got Paul correct. Um, he is coming at Paul from like what we would call a Western Christian viewpoint. And I think that's one of the errors that he does is he, obviously, Western Christianity is the dominant view of how Paul is looked at. But anyone who knows me and Steve, we come from an angle that we are believers in Yeshua, and we do believe that the law of Moshe is still applicable to our lives today. It is what we learn uh, when following Yeshua. It is what Yeshua taught. He taught the correct way. He was a prophet. And all prophets of the Bible do is they call you to repentance and they bring you back to Torah. And so understanding this and understanding the ways of Yeshua, we, even as Gentiles, know that we are to follow the Torah. And we believe that's exactly what Paul did. Paul ministered to the Gentiles, and he never taught the Gentiles how to not follow Torah. No, he brought them in to show them how to follow Torah after coming in to salvation by grace through Yeshua. It's the laws of the kingdom. And so Mr. Um, Dr. Avram, Avramson here, he's coming at Paul from a Western Christian point of view, which is oftentimes that the law of Moshe is done away with. It's not part of the new covenant. It ended in 70 CE and so forth. So we, you know, in saying all this, we just want to help you out to understand that both sides of the aisle are not seeing the scriptures correctly. They are not seeing the life of Paul correctly. And we want to kind of help bring out just our point of view, just our opinion, so that you've got all three here lined up and you can share and understand and study to show yourself approved to see who has it right. Amen. What is most consistent with the scriptures? But, you know, we like um, Dr. Mm -hmm. Hillel uh, Amramson. We feel he does a good job. Uh, and so, yeah, we're going to enjoy our time together here. Uh, Brother Steve is going to be leading a lot of this here. He's done a lot of, uh, you know, looking at this video, and so have I. But, yeah, we're going to just have a good time with this today and respect all points of view. But we want you guys to decide which one you think is most consistent with Scripture. Amen. So how you doing, Brother Steve? I'm doing well, Tony. Thanks Amen. for hosting this meeting today. Amen. I'm excited. Well, why don't you go ahead, Steve, and uh, kind of, uh, you know, take the lead here, and uh, we'll just kind of go from there. We're just going to wing this thing and see uh, exactly what uh, what comes up of this. Sounds good. Well, it is uh, March 28th, 2023, and we're approaching Pesach very quickly, so we're excited about that. So I wanted to start out today with a, a few verses out of uh, Tehillim Psalms, which really embody a lot of what Shaul's... Uh, what his core principles were. So this is out of uh, Tehillim chapter 19, verse starting with verse 8. The Torah of Adonai is perfect, restoring the inner person. The instruction of Adonai is sure, making wise the thoughtless. The precepts of Adonai are right, rejoicing the heart. The mitzvah of Adonai is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of Adonai is clean, enduring forever. The rulings of Adonai are true. They are righteous altogether, more desirable than gold, than much fine gold. Also sweeter than honey or dripping from the honeycomb. Through them, your servant is warned. In obeying them, there is great reward. And this promises to whoever, whoever reads and obeys. Amen. So we'll just do kind of an introductory here. So uh, Rabbi uh, Dr. Hillel Abramson, um, the, his YouTube presentation was made in 2013 to summarize the life and ministry of Paul as relate, related to the current uh, Jewish audience in the developing Gentile congregations in the first century. So as an Orthodox Jew, 
uh, Dr. Abraham, he, he attempts to provide some overview of Paul's contributions to what he terms as the Christian religion. There's also discussion about the purported anti-Semitic teachings of Paul. We'll discuss those. So uh, Abraham's knowledge of Talmudic literature, scripture, and historical sources provide a, a really well-informed perspective of the first uh, century dynamics of Judaism. So his scholarship and his moderation is really to be commended. He's tackled a topic which has been a flashpoint of controversy between Jews and Christians for centuries, and he attempts to bring a balanced perspective of all the available facts. He presents the majority opinion of Orthodox Judaism regarding Paul, but Tony mentioned a minute ago, we're going to give our opinions, but really my opinion means nothing, my, my credentials mean nothing, so we're going to examine Scripture and see how everything lines up with Scripture. So although I appreciate Dr. Abramson's perspective, it'll be useful to examine some of his postulations to determine if they really are in agreement with the biblical text. I'm not fully satisfied that they are, and we'd like to present an alternative viewpoint for your consideration. And we'll try to be as moderate as he was, and uh, I hope everybody that views this video can gain a better perspective of, of Shaul. So to help achieve this, let's think about Paul of Tarsus as somebody you might know as Shaul, the Jewish rabbi of the tribe of Benjamin. So I think the correct picture of, of uh, Shaul has escaped both Orthodox Judaism and Orthodox Western Christianity, which is very interesting. He's seen as the poster boy for Western Christianity. However, in the larger picture, any study of Shaul needs to be connected to the study of Yeshua, since he was considered by Shaul to be the Mashiach. So the mere historical facts about Shaul aren't nearly as important as his message. So therefore, we're going to examine the message and determine the relevance. Uh, Jewish perspective of Christian leaders in general, and Shaul in particular, is understandably biased. He's imagined as a spokesman of the Christian doctrine, which repudiates Judaism by replacing it. It's, you know, we know that as replacement theology. As a result, um, through the centuries, Jews have suffered as a result of church decrees, politics, and military actions, and so forth. So therefore, Shaul is found guilty by association, although he neither spoke, wrote, nor acted maliciously toward any of his Jewish contemporaries. Paradoxically, the church sees him as the champion and the crusader for replacement theology. They actually believe that he converted from being Shaul, the Jewish rabbi, to Paul, the Roman Christian, on the road to Damascus. So if this is repeated long enough, uh, as it is hundreds of times from pulpits every year, Christian churches, uh, people believe it. The problem is they're not fact-checking their Bibles, or they would stand up and protest or possibly question that. We read in uh, Acts uh, chapter 21, verses 20 through 36, classic case of uh, social media misinformation, you know, poor Shaul is almost like trying to chase down a Facebook rumor. So his associates, they attempt to correct some false rumors about him, rejecting Moshe, circumcision, and traditions. They say, okay, Shaul, here's what we need to do. Let's have you sponsor these four men on their purification rites as proof that you observe Torah. So he agrees to this, but it backfires quickly, and public opinion shifts, and he becomes victim to uh, resulting persecution and so on. Um, so church leaders have portrayed Shaul as the architect of cutting-edge theologies, which depart from and replace Torah, and that, that supports supersessionism. And this is not conspiracy theory. I'm speaking from direct observation inside the beltway as it were okay so if we quickly look at the uh, canonization for the jewish bible we know that you know that's been canonized 22 books later separated to 39 the christian bible has includes the tanakh and the uh, new covenant scriptures 66 books and it's ironic that the christian bible although it contains the tanakh 
it suffers at the hands of the Western Church who persists in the replacement theology. You know, of course, this view holds that the New Testament has superseded the Old Testament and relegated it to a lower status, to, to the dustbin of history. You know, many verses out of the Tanakh are cherry-picked and misapplied, but Torah is still considered optional. Um, ten Devarim, the Ten Commandments are optional. You, it's an option just like a menu at McDonald's. You can pick what you want and leave the rest. You know, in seminary, I remember seeing people with a New Testament, and it was very odd. It's like a motorcycle with one handlebar. You know, when you look at all the gospel writers, all the verses that they quoted, they didn't quote themselves. They quoted the source scriptures, which were the Hebrew scriptures, the Tanakh, the Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim. That's what they quoted. So that's what we need to look at. That's our um, that's our foundation point. Okay, I want to try to run. Let's see. Let's. We talked about that the gospel writers referred to the Tanakh. Um, in Second Timothy, there's a verse that says that all Scripture is uh, profitable for doc doctrine and reproof. So all Scripture, people need to understand all Scripture. What they all used was the Tanakh. Um, Shaul contributed about approximately 13 letters to his associates in first century Judaism, and I think we may be certain of about six or seven, but prolific author and uh ironically shaul is not necessarily the per person of importance he refuses elevation and accepts the resulting hostility uh, from his context by virtue of association with yeshua whom he claimed was the mashiach so unfortunately there is anti-yeshua theology evident in talmudic writings and certain commentaries of the sages these uh, sentiments connect blame to Yeshua and by extension back to Paul. Shaul. Um, if, if Yeshua hadn't been considered the Mashiach by Shaul, then Shaul would have been just another voice in the crowd. You know, he could have made it, had an easier life and found wider acceptance among his uh, colleagues. So the Messianic recognition was the inspiration for his theology and it was the fuel for all of his opponents wrath what brought shaul into the limelight and the crosshairs of his contemporaries was his ability to engage with both gentiles and jews and since he was a jew with roman citizenship so the crosshairs are the illusion that shaul the jew was converted from judaism to paul the christian becoming the de facto spokesman for the next big thing, Christianity. The limelight for the church is the illusion that Shaul the Jew was converted from Judaism to Paul the Christian, becoming the de facto spokesman for Christianity. That's how he's seen from both sides of the aisle. That's a false perception. He was not anti-Semitic. He was a Jew. He loved the Jews. He taught Torah. Uh, Shaul born, he was born and died as a Jew. He never converted. He never repudiated Judaism. He never developed a new religion known as Christianity. He lived a Torah observant life by his own admission as recorded actions. He operated within the Prashim sect of Judaism. He did have discussions and some very uh, animated discussions with his, his own brothers. I just want to go through a few scriptures. Acts 24 14, I worship the God of our fathers in accordance with the way. I continue to believe everything that accords with the Torah and everything written in the prophets. Uh, Acts 25, 8. These are Shaul's words. Shaul said, I've committed no offense, not against the Torah, to which the Jews hold, not against the temple, and not against the emperor. Romans chapter 3, verse 31. Does it follow that we abolish Torah by this trusting? Heaven forbid. On the contrary, we confirm Torah. Romans 7, verse 12. So the Torah is holy. That is the commandment is holy, just, and good. Romans 15, 4. Uh, 15, 4 or everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that with the encouragement of the Tanakh, we might patiently hold on to our hope. Okay. 
I, I don't want to bore everybody, but uh, it's interesting that Shaul, he, he, as a good Jew, he argued amongst his brothers about points of the law, and that was expected. That was, you know, you're expected to uh, defend your position. His theological conflicts were mainly connected to his belief in Yeshua, which he claimed to be the Mashiach. So that puts him in the minority opinion right off the bat. Um, Paul of Tarsus and Shul the rabbi are two sides of the same man. He allowed his uh, upper class, or well, I would say he leveraged his upper class uh, upbringing, metropolitan, uh, you know, context to reach anyone possible. He was an itinerant tent maker by trade, and allowed, that allowed him to travel and learn and uh, schmooze with society. So he used his knowledge of Torah to articulate in public debate and private classes. And he was no stranger to conflict. He was pursuing his mission, and he was not deterred by conflict. He didn't seek an easier life. He didn't seek to be approved by everybody. One of his greatest challenges was probably writing the letters of scriptural truth to some of the developing ecclesias at that time. Um, he didn't repudiate Torah. He attempted to bring practical application to these communities that he addressed. He couldn't have known how his letters may have been followed and even misapplied in the next 2,000 years. So here's a question, series of questions. What was not scripture for Jews in the first century? What was not scripture for Shaul? What was not scripture for the Talmudin of Yeshua ben Yosef of Nazareth? What was not scripture for Yochanan the Revelator? The answer, the letters that they were currently circulating amongst themselves. That wasn't scripture. Scripture was Tanakh. It's important to recognize that. And so during this time, there were, there were many sects within Judaism. It was not a monolithic block, as Tony has talked about many times. That would just break down a few of them. There were the Prushim, the uh, teachers, scribes, elders, uh, minyan leaders, and they pretty much had favor with the people. The Sudukim, the elite of the temple service, they were the power brokers with Rome. Uh, the Essenes and the Qumran community, they were the separatists and the puritists. And, you know, we recognize them from the uh, Masada area. The Zealots, they were the uh, militants opponent. They were opponents of Roman rule and uh, could be seen as carryovers from the Hasmonean and Maccabean ideologies. Then you have Haderek, which is the way the small band of uh, Yeshua's Talmudim and his followers in the Nazaratim, the Amharets. These, you know, they were looked at, kind of looked down upon the simple people of the land. So Shaul identified with the Prashim. He argued with them, but um, he traversed the traditions and the pagan practices of Greek philosophies, but he used Torah as his textbook. He used concise legal terminology to communicate with people and uh, showing them the clarity of it. And if we can read what Joel wrote, if we can understand, if we if we read what he read, we can understand what he wrote. So only in the context of that can we understand what he was conveying to the listeners and to us. His message still rings true. Okay, let me, I will try to fast forward through this. Tony is going to play a clip here in a minute, the first one from uh, Dr. Abramson. So, you know, Shaul collaborated with uh, Kifa, Rinaba, Yuda, Yaakov, and the elders of the Jerusalem Council to discuss and agree on four common sense, entry level behavioral prerequisites for inclusion in the community of these developing believers. If we go to Acts 15, you can look it up, Acts 15, uh, 19 through 20. He did not invent a four-law system, nor did he preclude further Torah instruction. It was not assumed, as many Christian doctrines assert, that they would remain ignorant of further instruction. They weren't going to stay babies. They were expected to progress in their learning and their observance of Torah. The understanding was that these new believers had a starting point with further instruction to come. Um, shall be, I'll just read a little clip from verse 21. From earliest times, Moshe has had in every city those who proclaim him with his words being read in the synagogues every Shabbos. 
So Rabbi Abramson has questioned Shaul's belief in and, and adherence to the mitzvah of circumcision, which I find quite puzzling because Shaul's position is clearly stated in uh, Acts 16, 1 through 3. Uh, if, if we remember that, Shaul had brought along, uh, he called Timothy his son. He was, he was a tummy. So he had, had arranged for uh, Timothy's brit milah. It was common knowledge that Timothy had a Greek father and a Jewish mother. So apparently, like uh, Moshe's son Gershom, he'd missed his opportunity, and Shaul found it necessary to complete the mitzvah so they can be considered um, legitimate teachers. It, but Shaul was very adamant about something that he wanted people to understand. Circumcision does not produce righteousness but follows it. We think about the first Pesach, you know, it's coming up here in a week. Circumcision was not required to be saved from the destroying angel. Circumcision was, however, required to eat the Pesach Seder. So the Goim, the people who had joined themselves to the B'nai Israel, you know, they were wishing to join them and leave. They're, you know, the big exodus, they wanted to go. They didn't need to be circumcised. They, if, if they didn't, they didn't eat the meal, but they needed to be inside the houses of the Israelites where the lamb's blood was applied to the door. And we understand that Avraham Avinu was saved by trusting in Adonai. His status as a Sadiq came before his Brit Malah, not after. So obedience to this brand new mitzvot, mitzvah did not produce his righteousness, but it naturally followed it. Okay, so let's talk for a minute about, uh, we might look at the, the four, um, four uh, ideas that the, uh, the council had come up with in Jerusalem and kind of relate that to Noahide laws. It's worth noting that Shaul, Yeshua, and the gospel writers always and only use Torah as a standard by which good works were judged. Nothing about Noahide laws were ever mentioned. It's clear that Shaul had a somewhat adversarial relationship with uh, some of the extra biblical traditions. He and associates were what you may call halakhic purists. They held to written Torah and reputed, repudiated the fence laws, which obscured it and were on a, opposition to it. So why Torah? Why not Noahide laws? Why? Well, <laughs> the answer is simple. Torah can save us, Noahide laws cannot. Um, some sages and rabbis following centuries-old traditions postulate that Gentiles who wish to live righteous lives before God cannot and should not obey Torah. Instead, they should obey the Noahide laws. Yes, who? who says? Since Torah is God's law for mankind, why would anybody wish to be um, spiritually restricted? Who are the ministerial custodians of these mythical Noahide laws? I need to know. Who determines the merits of man-made rules? Who's the enforcement authority? To whom are they applied? And here's a question, a question for us. Does Torah prohibit anyone from observing Torah? No, it does not. That's the Jews are the light to the nations. That's what saves us. Okay. I, I don't want to spend too much time on that. The, the commonly accepted 613 mitzvot that we, we see as Torah are within our grasp. To subtract 606 of these and come up with some mythical Noahide laws are, uh, it's incidentally, it's optional. It, it's just like Western Christianity to take pick and choose. At Harsinai, 50 days after the exodus, uh, Moshe received the ten Devarim directly from God. He taught them to Israel and the Goim who were gathered with them there at Horeb. So they were given the same laws as the commonwealth of B'nai Israel. And this is crucial for our understanding. This is something that Shaul was very adamant about. His mission, he felt that his mission was to go to the nations to bring people into the light of Torah. 
this is central to what he taught in uh Pasha Akaremot. We read their words coming from, from God to Moshe Raveno. And uh Vayikra 185, you're to observe my laws and ruling, laws and rulings. If a person does them, he will have life through them. And that word we know it's Adam, a person. That includes everybody. If a person does them, he will have life through them. I am Adonai. Um, the prophet uh, Ezekiel relates this specific word four times. And I won't go through all these verses. Uh, Ezekiel 20, 11, 13, 19 through 21. So that whole theme of the commonwealth being, including the Goim, who are God fears, is taught by Shul. That's his core principle. Um, so Israel is, they need to be the light to the nations. That's the whole point. So Shaul was seen as the evangelist for Torah. He didn't need to talk to his own people. They already had it. He thought, okay, you guys got this. Fine, I'm going to go talk to the Gentiles. They need to learn. So as a Roman speaking, as a Roman citizen speaking Hebrew, Greek and Aramaic, you know, Shaul was a sharp guy. He still retained his Jewishness. He crossed over to the lecture halls of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, arguing convincingly against the decadence of polytheism and paganism, advocating for obedience to the God of Israel. Monotheism, you know, it's a, it's a big jump. It was a mental pole vault for the uh, Hellenized, soon to be converts to even consider monotheism. You know, the, the prevailing pagan idea was. The more gods, the better. Uh, the god known as Adonai was not rendered visually by any idols common at the time. Uh, by contrast, the Jews held to the uh, faith of their fathers. The covenant was held. That never disappeared. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on Hellenization, but it really, it's not something that went away. That's being carried forward with uh, Western Christianity. Uh, Rabbi Michael Skobak says that to understand Judaism more fully, we must know what Judaism is not. So I respect his opinion, but I disagree for this reason. Our primary focus should not should should always be Torah. All other religions are delusions; they just lead nowhere. So I don't need I don't need to investigate all those. I I know a gentleman. Uh, he's, he's considered a friend of mine. He's a he. He's at the uh, a Zen temple in northern Michigan, and uh, we're friends. But I, I'm not going to investigate that religion. I'm not going to investigate all the errant doctrines that are out there in the world. Thirty thousand plus Christian doctrines and all the Eastern religions. It's going to take me a lifetime to look at Torah, and I'm I'm thick headed, so it <laughs> it's an everyday process. Okay, so Dr. Abram says uh, he's noted this, that these erroneous ideas are a perception of both Jews and Christians. These perceptions created the groundwork for anti-Yeshua theology, which began to make its way into Talmudic literature well after his death. Um, the chasm between Judaism and Christianity had already started in the first century. You might even conclude from history that Hellenization began to have its effects starting with Emperor Alexander, and it's gained impetus through the church ever since. Um, let me, I'm going to skip over some of this process, you know, the process of Hellenization, we, you could talk all day, and that's a, it's a, it's a subject that can go on and on. Uh, okay, so contenders for Mashiach in the first century, there's some well-known candidates in the last 2200 years since the Maccabean Revolt. Uh, Yeshua ben Yosef of Nazareth, he died in 33 CE. Shimon bar Kokhba, he died in 135 CE. Shabtai Svi died uh, 1676 CV, CE. Um, the Rebbe, Menachem Schneerson, died in 1995. And of course, there's the current contender, which is promoted. Actually, I hear more of this promotion by the Western Christianity side is... Um, uh, Yunoka Rav Shlomo, Yehuda Biri, uh, you know, but he's just a nice guy. He, he's not promoting himself as Mashiach. So there's a lot of Mashiach, uh, contenders for Mashiach. So it's important to note that of all these 
candidates that were contenders, uh, you know, Shaul centered on Yeshua ben Yosef of Nazareth. Okay. Tony, would you like to go ahead and play that clip now and we'll uh, begin to comment on that? Sure. As, okay. um, as Steve nicely said, I mean, we, <clears throat> we have to be clear with that. Uh, the emphasis that we're putting on Torah here is the way of walking after coming into salvation. None of us, me or Steve, thinks that obedience to Torah will save you in the sense of give you eternal salvation. But when Steve talks about that Torah will save you, it will save you from walking in evil ways. It will save you from walking away from Yeshua. Yes, that's why it's so important to get the instructions of the Torah, because the Torah was a way of walking. It was a way of walking in relationship with, um, with Adonai. And so and it's the same instructions Yeshua taught. So, yes, Yeshua is our only means of entering the kingdom and having our sins uh, taken away and cleansed. But after that, what do you do? Just like Steve's been sharing with you, Paul taught people how to follow Torah. And that's where the big mix-up continually comes in. Um, and so, yeah, we just want to be clear that in no way are we saying Torah gives us eternal salvation. It is the way of walking after you've received Yeshua. Amen. So we're going to go ahead and uh, play this clip. We're going to let um, uh, Dr. Abramson um, go ahead and give his introduction and how he sees Paul. And we will be stopping in between here just to give you our thoughts and opinion. Go straight to the lecture then. Okay. So speaking about Paul. As I mentioned, he is a hugely influential Jewish apostle, meaning he was one of the principal followers of Jesus in his lifetime and shortly thereafter, arguably the most important of all the apostles. Certainly within the arguments that were held between the various apostles, Paul's position on the future of Christianity was regnant and it was ultimately his decision on how to portray Christianity that made it so popular with the non-Jewish world and took it from being a small sect involving a, a, you know, a, an obscure group of Jews in Jerusalem, a very provincial place, and made it part of the world stage. When we look at the sheer volume of work that he's responsible for, about 14 of 27 books of the Christian New Testament uh, are attributed to Paul. Likely seven of them are authentic and others may have been attributed later in his life. Still a very significant uh, proportion of them. Um, and during his entire life, you know, well, I won't go into that joke now. During his life, although he was uh, obsessed and completely occupied with the spread of Christianity, he was also engaged in a very difficult internal dialogue that he was quite uh, open about in the text of his various writings uh, with the Torah trying to understand what is the role of the Torah in this new movement following Jesus. And we're going to spend a lot of time in the next 45 odd minutes exploring various aspects of this, but maybe I'll just say it in one sentence now before we return to it. Basically, um, there was a huge debate among the apostles as to whether Jesus wanted uh, his thought to be interpreted as a variety of Judaism, meaning that all Christians should be following the Torah just as regular Jews were, that the Torah retains its validity and that um, all of the commandments are completely binding on every follower of Jesus. Or, as Paul argued, that there was a new covenant that somehow replaced the old covenant at least for non-Jews. Meaning, if your typical Greek or Roman wanted to come within the, you know, the realm of Christian teaching, did they have to also adopt all kinds of Jewish behaviors, such as circumcision and kashrut, or were they free to ignore those commandments and somehow create a different kind of faith, to articulate some different sort of religion. Uh, and so he was occupied all the time with this question of what is the meaning of 
Torah for the Christian world. It's also important to note that the term used for Torah in itself says something about his relationship with it and also had a huge impact on you know, the way the, the world as a whole views the Torah, and it's somewhat limiting in its scope. The word used in Paul's writings, at least as we have them today in Greek, is nomos, which means basically law, standard, rule, decree, these kinds of things. It means like these are the rules of behavior. The word Torah, of course, is much larger than that. It comes from the, the root word hora'a, which means instruction, teaching, direction, guidance, which is far more um, you know, wide and broad than the idea of a narrow law. There's like a moral world, a moral kind of scope to things, which cannot be bounded in a single you know, specific do this or don't do that. Uh, but nevertheless, the use of the word nomos, translated as law, says something about how people viewed the Torah through the lens of the Greek language. And of course, flowing from that is the fact that if Paul had a difficult time with the Torah, he certainly had a difficult time dealing with his Jewish origins. What was he himself supposed to be? What kind of identity as a Christian was he supposed to adopt? How was he supposed to portray that? How was he especially supposed to portray it to non-Jews? He is known All right, so this is uh, basically in the sermation here. Um, me and Brother Steve would not really agree with, um, you know, what in full, what um, Dr. Abramson is doing here, um, because he's missing the point of what Paul was actually um, trying to portray to the people. It had not, it had nothing to do with Torah. It had to do with the oral law of the day. All right. It had to do, how do we deal with these Gentiles who are coming in? We're going to begin to teach them Torah, because that's the way of walking. That's the way of Yeshua. But oral Torah is where the problem was, because oral Torah had to do with circumcision for conversion. Otherwise, you're not a full member of the community. you know. And of course, they built fence laws around the Torah. How are we going to get these Gentiles to follow and become part of our community and not be fully, you know, committed to the oral Torah, the, you know, the community binding laws of the day. This is what Paul is dealing with oftentimes when he says law in his, um, in his epistles, in his writings. And uh, Dr. Albertson here is just missing it, right? And, but he's following Western Christianity thought. Western Christianity thought Paul was wrestling with how much Torah do I get? How much of the law of Moses am I supposed to allow the Gentiles, you know, to do? No, it, that was not his struggle. It was the oral Torah of the day. Uh, Steve, you want to share a little bit? Well, yeah, you know, <clears throat> Dr. Abramson said, uh, he, he said, you know, Paul had a difficult time with Torah. He didn't. There was yeah. no difficult time. He under, understood it fully. He didn't have a problem with his Jewish origins. He did not take on a Christian identity. Um, like like we mentioned, you know, both Western Christianity and Orthodox Judaism has has positioned Paul as the Roman Christian instead of Shaul, the Jewish rabbi. It's unfortunate, but he he's a convenient he's a convenient uh, perspective to say, okay, as a Jew, I can marginalize Shaul. As a Christian. He's my hero. So that's my take. <laughs> yeah, amen. I mean, so for those of you listening, you know, even these words Christian, we got to we gotta get our definitions correct, right? Because I will accuse uh, most people who use the term Christian, they're using it when they're trying to place it back in the first century, they're using it in an acronistic way. The word Christian in the first century meant a Torah follower of Messiah. Messiah Yeshua. Christian just means follower of Messiah. So that term would have included a Torah follower. It would have not been thought anything different. It's 2,000 years later. We're now using this word Christian, and it's the buzzword for someone who doesn't follow Torah but believes in Yeshua by faith. And so even Dr. Um, uh, Amerson here, he, that's how he uses the word Christian. It's a non-Torah observant Gentile. And that simply wasn't the case in the first century, right, Steve? Exactly. Yeah. 
So that's that's another thing. We've got to get our terms defined when we're having a conversation with people so that we're not talking past each other that way. Um, so if me or Steve were to talk to Dr. Armisen here, we would help, you know, try to get our terms defined with one another before talking so that we can be on the same page. Yes. As the apostle to what's that? Yeah, the next clip will talk about some of his ministry areas. Go ahead, Tony. Okay, okay. To the Gentiles, because unlike the other apostles who basically wanted to keep it in the family, that Christianity was a Jewish affair, only for Unzera, only for us, Paul argued that in fact Jesus' message was much larger and should be taken outside of the family to the larger world. Okay, okay. so that's the quick introduction. Okay, so that's that's a good point. I agree with that. Uh, Shaul saw his calling and his ministry to go to the Gentiles. And he, you know, it wasn't an easy road. He was an evangelist for Torah. So I had to look this up. So, uh, you know, he's from Tarsus. Uh, it's about, it's South Central Turkey, about 20 or 12 miles inland from the Mediterranean. Um, so... Shaul took this literally. He went to Lycia, Pamphylia, Syria, Cyprus, Cilicia, Cappadocia, Galatia, Phrygia, Asia Minor, Macedonia, which is southern Bulgaria, Thessalonica, and Achaia, which is Greece. And so there's Jewish diaspora congregations in these areas. And he wanted to engage with the Jews and the Greeks. It's a lot to learn. So, and he was, he was a world traveler at that point, very metropolitan. Yeah, I mean, and you you already walked through several scriptures, Steve, um, you know, Acts 24, Acts 25, and, and those passages in Romans, and, you know, you could do Acts, um, Acts 28, 17, and so forth. Through Paul's testimony, though he was falsely accused oftentimes, or the Judean leaders would try and bring up charges that they couldn't prove against him, he always taught both the Gentile and the Jew to follow Torah though he was often accused of not doing that. But what me and Steve are going to continue to, to push, it'll be like a broken record. You have to examine the oral Torah of the day. You have to examine the binding of their communities where, yes, it was Torah, but it was also on top of that, their oral Torah. And, it, and we can't make make this re really well we can we're making this really clear there was not one oral torah of the first century there were oral torahs different communities had different community laws and rules that you must adhere to to be part of their community and so don't even you know take on the fantasy that there was one oral torah that dates all the way back to moshe that's a false um you know statement it's a myth and so this is really what Paul is battling, battling from community to community is how do we teach the Gentiles to follow Torah? We've got these community rules going on. What's what's what are we going to do with this? Amen. So, you know, a good example. I might have a bone to pick with you, Tony. Uh, you know, my my Talit, my my tzitzit are tied Ashkenazi style. I mean, are, are yours Sephardic or what? It could be good. Right. If, if you did your Sephardic, we may have an argument. Yep. Right? <laughs> yeah. Or if I did it, neither of the two, right? Right. You're like, oh, you're not even either of the two, right? Yeah, exactly. So what and, did Moshe and, command? <laughs> yeah, man. You know, and I liked what you were talking about circumcision, right? Because that was a big deal. Circumcision. What do we do with the Gentile? Um, this was the oral law, it was the issue of, is circumcision required to be part of our community, or is it not, right? That was something that wasn't a part of the original giving of the Torah. That discussion wasn't there, because the instructions in the Torah is the Gentile does not have to be circumcised to be part of the community. But by the first century, and because of the Maccabean revolt and so forth, it becomes an extremely serious issue to be discussed on, does the Gentile have to be circumcised to be an equal member? And Acts 15 says no, Paul says no, but when it comes to following the Torah, they say yes to both of them. So, Right. ...of Paul. Let's go on to the next slide here. Uh, he was born in Tarsus, we can see over here, is um, roughly in modern-day Turkey, in Asia Minor. Uh, fairly wealthy family, 
Uh, he received a very uh, strong classical Hellenistic education, fluent in Greek and most likely in Koina, the vernacular, as well as in Hebrew. Um, he went by his Hebrew name Shaul or Saul and in fact it appears that he did not like change his name from Shaul to Paul, he used these simultaneously. There are several references in the Christian Bible, uh, things like Paul the one who is called Saul, or, uh, you know, the terms seem to be fairly interchangeable, although on the whole the word, the name Paul is prominent. So I think it's a lot like what it is today. For example, my Hebrew name is Hillel, and my, what I like to call my slave name is Henry, right? And I use both of those interchangeably depending on the context, who I'm talking to, and things like that. So that's a, that's a great example, because Western Christianity, I've heard preachers sometimes say, well, when Paul converted to from Judaism to Christianity, he changed his name from Shaul to Paul. And as you can see uh, with Dr. Abramson here, that is just a false accusation. He never stopped being a Jew. He never stopped Judaism. So, and again, that tradition kind of follows all the way up 2,000 years. Look at the tra tradition of, you know, his name being Hillel and Henry, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just something within the culture. Exactly. And it appears that Paul of Tarsus, also known as Saul or Shaul of Tarsus, um, used these identities simultaneously and could flit between the two of them. Uh, his family, as I mentioned, were wealthy and he held Roman citizenship by birth, but he never disavowed his Jewish origins. He never, like for example, um, socialists, Jewish socialists of the early 20th century, some of whom would say things like, I am not a Jew, I am a communist, right? Or I am not a Jew, I am a Soviet citizen. That's not the kind of approach that Paul took. He definitely acknowledged his Jewish roots and he refers to himself throughout the Bible in places like a Pharisee, son of a Pharisee. You'll recall the Pharisees, the Prushim. We spoke about them a couple weeks ago in terms of Jewish sectarianism. Basically the rabbis. Uh, he refers to him as of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. Shaul is a common name among Benjaminites because of King Shaul. A Hebrew... I mean, Steve, you wanted to stop here? Uh, yeah, let's see. We're... Okay, so Dr. Uh, Abramson uh, sees you, uh, at one point he, he saw Yeshua as a rebellious regime. So you're looking at Shaul's, uh, the one who he claimed was the Mashiach, Yeshua ben Yosef of Nazareth. He functioned as an iconoclast. He, he declared allegiance to no particular sect of Judaism. Yet he overlapped with some on occasion. Sometimes he railed against the defense laws of the Prushim, sometimes he was in agreement with them. He brought militant zealots into his inner circle, yet he agreed with paying taxes to Caesar. So, like like you mentioned before, Tony, sometimes it, we look at Shaul for a minute and then look at who his mentor was, Yeshua. Yeshua had his own iconoclastic teachings of Torah. Hillel, Shammai, all those guys, they sometimes mirrored what Yeshua said, not the other way around. Um, are we at the 18-minute mark yet on these uh, videos? No, we were just okay. at, the, at the part where, um, you know, he's he's identifying Paul as uh, from the tribe of Benjamin. And yes. so just giving him his credentials. And then, of course, he never stopped identified as, being identified as a parashim, as a Pharisee throughout yes. his entire life, he never laid that down and said, I am no longer one of those, you know. Um, he is, you know, he is a top lawyer, everyone. You don't get, you don't receive paperwork from the high priest and be able to go into other countries and arrest people and so forth if you are not highly regarded within the Sanhedrin. Highly regarded. He sat under the feet of Gamliel. And so his ability of understanding both the law both the oral law and also Roman law. He was an expert in all of those. He knew those inside and out, and that's why we see how he uses that throughout his life through the book of Acts. Um, yes. So understanding that each moment within each of his writings, what part 
or what law is he talking about is very key because unfortunately people like Dr. Abramson and Western Christianity, every time they see the word law, they just think Torah, Torah, Torah. And he is weaving through Roman law, oral law, Torah. He's going, you got to understand the context there. And that's yes, what's one, one, I'm sorry. Wait, you know, one one spot he mentioned that Paul flipped back and forth. Well, Paul, he didn't, you know, he, he could identify as a Roman, as a Jew. He was both. He was like a dual citizenship, but he never wavered in his commitments. His, his rule of life, he didn't switch back and forth between Roman paganism and Jewish monothe monotheism. He didn't do that. His right. identity crossed over, metropolitan area. Right. But his core principles, what he lived by, was Torah, as you said. Yeah, Steve, when you read um, Acts 25, that is a verse I use all the time to show that Paul said, I've done no offense, I've committed no offense against the Torah of my people, against the temple, or against Caesar. You see, the Jews were permitted by Caesar to follow Torah. They were they were permitted. They wouldn't be uh, thrown in jail for following Torah. So that statement alone of not offending the Torah or the temple, excuse me, that shows you that he was teaching everyone to keep Torah, and they were still permitted to go to the temple and do offerings. Yes. Otherwise, Paul is lying there. He, otherwise, he's given a false testimony, and he's not. of the Hebrews. So he clearly places the locus of his identity within the sphere of Judaism. Um, his family um, made their living through tent making, which sounds kind of obscure to us today, I guess. I don't know anyone who is a tent maker today, even though it is in the needle trade, or you know, like my father would say, the shmata business. But back then, I guess tent making was probably something like being a contractor or being a developer, right? You can say, I can, we can put 20 tents out here. You know, we have a lot of people coming about be Levittown, or Lenard. <laughs> yeah, not very funny. Okay. Um, uh, in terms of the, his relationship with the rest of his family, we only know little scattered bits about his family, and many of those bits come from later unreliable sources, so it's not clear. However, he, in his own writings, refers to some of his cousins who apparently were also in the family business and also became Christian before him. So there's kind of like an extended phenomenon going on with his family. Now, we should understand early Christianity in its Jewish context. Just here, just by way of kind of diversion. Um, the top here is uh, one of Rembrandt's paintings of Jesus. And the bottom picture here is one of his paintings of Jesus. And the top is his model for Jesus. One of the interesting things about Rembrandt is that he felt that, you know, rather than looking at classical Greek and Roman art for the models for you know, biblical figures, he looked to contemporary Jews living in Amsterdam in the 17th century. So he went out and he found a young Sephardic Jew. This is called, by Rembrandt, Portrait of a Young Sephardic Jew. And it's clear that he took his face as, boy, that guy looks just like Jesus. And then he made, modeled Jesus right on him. The, the reason why I put these two pictures here is to show uh, that we have to understand Christianity is really deeply a Jewish phenomenon in the first century, really bleeding into the second century. It's an overwhelmingly Jewish phenomenon. Everybody's Jewish. Jesus is Jewish. The apostles are Jewish. People who argue with them are Jewish. Everyone is Jewish. And Christianity represents, in one sense, the earliest and wildly successful breakaway minion of all time. Right? You're probably familiar with that term, breakaway minion. It's when you know you have a very successful shul, and it's so successful that someone has to complain about something, and so they get together, 10 guys, and they go and they start another shul down the road. Kind of like amoebas, you know. And I think this is very important, everyone. For the first 130 years or so, it was dominantly a Jewish entity. The believers in Yeshua went to synagogue, Amen. They followed the Torah. And for the first, um, you know, probably from, you know, 30 CE or whatever, from the whatever date you believe that Yeshua died, whether it's 30 or 33 or whatnot, from the time of the resurrection of Yeshua until at least after, shortly after 100 CE, maybe 120 CE, it is dominantly a Jewish entity.
right? The the Gentiles, there are a lot of Gentiles there, but they um, are outnumbered by the Jewish numbers, right? It's not until the Bar Kukva revolt, or maybe shortly before it or so forth, we start seeing the change where there are more Gentiles coming to believe in Yeshua than there are Jews. And Dr. Um, Avramson here is going to share why a lot of this is happening. That Bar Kukva revolt is very important. Because that is where the decline, the big decline, begins to happen for Jewish followers of Yeshua. Brother Steve, anything you want to want to add? No, it's go right to it. I'm I'm fine. <clears throat> Replicating and things like that. So, early Christianity is in its origins, though it's just a breakaway minion. It's like a group of Jews who have a slightly different shita, a slightly different opinion about what the um, the figure of Jesus means, and they decided to branch off on their own. But as we shall see, that branch grew dramatically wider over time. It did not heal as many of these breakaway minions will, as shuls will coalesce and come back together based on social economic reasons. This breakaway minion really took off and went in a different direction. Um, and I hope to explore some of the reasons for that over the course of the next half hour or so. We should, however, place Jesus within his context. And this is a little bit more difficult. But if you recall, there are four basic socio-political religious orientations of Jews in the first century. You had the Sadducees who were essentially capitulating to Rome. They tended to be the establishment, the man, right? Caiaphas, the high priest in the Christian texture, the testament. Uh, you had the Pharisees who were the rabbis who were largely dispossessed of formal power structures but had a great deal of popularity on the ground. Um, uh, you know, charismatic local leaders and so on. Uh, then you had the zealots who were kind of, you know, you know, angry and, and just looking for an opportunity to try and fight against Rome and against other Jews who disagree with their position. And you had the Essenes and various groups like them who sought, you know, radical departure from society, living in the, the caves and things like that. So placing Jesus within that you kind of, you know, four quadrants, it appears very clear that he is a rebellious Pharisee, meaning his whole worldview is very Pharisaic in nature. His, his teachings are heavily dependent on rabbinic teachings, in particular that of Hillel. Uh, there's no question that he has a particular bent when he looks at Pharisaic teachings, he tends to be very pacifistic, tends to be very you know, uh, turn the other cheek. All of the, the most famous of Jesus' sayings are really taken from earlier Jewish sayings, either in the written Torah or in the oral Torah. Yet, he was rebellious, meaning he was... All right, everyone. So we want to challenge um, exactly what Dabur, uh, Dr. Amundsen uh, just said. First of all, Yeshua didn't belong to any sect, okay? There are a lot of people that argue... Which sect did Yeshua? Did he follow the Perushim? Did he follow the Essenes? Did he, you know, we know uh, how he felt about the Kohanim, the, you know, the priesthood there and how that was corrupt and so forth. But what we have to understand is Dr. Amramson here just made an acronistic statement here as if the sayings of Hillel and Shammai were before Yeshua or he was following after their teachings or following along their teachings is simply unfounded. It can't be proven at all. Anyone who has studied the Mishnah and the history of the Mishnah and how it was put together, it's very problematic to say that the words of Halal and Shammai that are being spoken of within the Talmud were actually what they were said in the first century. And also, many of the traditions and so forth. Um, again, Dr. Amundsen has a belief that the oral Torah goes all the way back to Sinai, or at least goes back to the time of Ezra for most people. And so they always try to make it seem like that their teachings and their sayings predate Yeshua, when in fact there's no proof of that. Okay, that is um, completely uh, conjecture, that is completely just their belief, but it is unfounded. Okay. When you understand the Mishnah and how it was created, you understand that it is hundreds and hundreds of years later. The very first 
full um, evidence of the Talmud that we have comes from the 11th, 12th century, where we start reading what were the sayings of Hillel and Shammai and so forth. Um, that is a thousand years after Yeshua, and there's been editing and redactions being made when this whole thing is being put together and so forth. And so, no, they want you to think that those sayings of Hillel and Shammai were exactly what they were saying, that they actually said those things, but we don't have proper evidence of that. It is dated much, much later. And so when we look at the writings of Hillel and Shammai and what they said, you have to put them in the century from which these other rabbis were recording what they said. This is what they think they said in that century. So let me go ahead. I'm going to read you some Talmudic scholars on their view of the Mishnah and the Talmud. Um, these are non-believers in Yeshua, and these are experts of the Talmud. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up a few quotes. All right, so the first quote is by Professor Avig, Avigdor Shinan, an expert of Hazal, or sages, Literature from University of Yerushalayim said, I'm a professor in the Hebrew University in Yerushalayim, and my field of research is Jewish literature in the post-biblical period, which means everything from the 2nd century BC, the Mishnah, the Talmud, the Siddur, the Haggadah, and Bible translation. Our leading theology in Judaism is not from the Bible. The halakha that guides us today is not biblical halakha. The Jewish halakha, Shabbat precepts, Kashrut precepts, everything you can think about, there is no Kaddish in the Bible, there is no Kol Nidre, all vows in the Bible, no Bar Mitzvah in the Bible, there is no Talit in the Bible. Everything you track as Jewish, if you track its origin, is not in the Bible. It's Hazel Sages, where it all starts. Also, Oops. It's, it's, an interesting, uh, it's an interesting perspective, and he's a, you know, he's a scholar that's researched this. Yes. And he's, he's tracked the origins of the uh, halakha. I am having trouble with my thing freezing now. Oh. I don't know why. Let's see here. Well, somebody mentioned a few weeks ago, and you may have run across it, you know, the Shammai and Hillel, uh, the, the concept that they were actual people, yes, were they well-known rabbis, or are there just, were there just arguments for the sake of keeping the, keeping the whole discussion within the Jewish context that's still to be decided, and that's something that bears further um, that bears further excavation of truth. Oh, absolutely. All right. So the next quote that I have is from Professor Shay Razin Zivi, the head of the Talmudic department at Tel Aviv University, wrote in his book Between Mishnah and Midrash about the rabbinical attempt to claim the oral Torah is ancient and originates from the Bible period. He says different sources of Hazal, meaning sages, writings claim the oral Torah was given during the time of the Mosaic writings. These arguments are based on speculative restorations and even on mythical ones and even on controversial motives which have nothing to do with empirical or facts. We have no pre hazalak uh, sources that can approve such arguments regarding the oral Torah. Now, we also have Professor Alan Avery Peck, a researcher in Judaism and an expert in Hazal writings, says rabbinic idea of an oral Torah cannot be counted as a serious collection of rules and interpretations which existed through the whole history of the people of Israel. And then the final one that I have is by Dr. Neusner, which is one of the most famous um, Talmudic scholars of our era, of our day. All right, and then uh, the final one I have, uh, you can find it in uh, with Tim Haig saying, 
Thus, even though in sources like the Mishnah, the Tosefta, the Talmuds, and the Midrashim, sages who lived in the earlier centuries are referenced in accordance with their teachings and halakhic rulings. This by no means is a valid criterion by which one can confidently place the date of such a ruling. For as Jacob Neusner affirms, ample evidence is virtually, ev uh, I'm sorry, ample evidence in every virtual Virtually every document of rabbinic literature sustains the proposition that it is quite common for sages to make up sayings and stories and attribute the sayings to or tell the stories about other prior authorities. So in other words, when we start looking at the words of Halal, we start looking at the words of Shammai, you can only speculate they might have said that in the first century. We agree, like Steve said, there were actual persons, Halal and Shammai in the first century. What did they actually say? What were their actually ruling, what their actual rulings are? You cannot be confident or sure that what you're reading in the Talmud is what they said. It is my opinion that they are putting these sayings on Halal and Shammai because you have um, Jewish believers throughout the centuries that the rabbis are battling. They call them the heretics in the Talmud. Mm -hmm. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. Sorry, everyone. I've got a small cold, so I'm kind of battling this cold here. <clears throat> but what you have is the sayings of Yeshua came first. The sayings of Paul came first. Then later, you've got sayings of Hillel and Shammai that may or may not have happened. And they are battling within their community, believers of Yeshua. And so they are obviously going to attribute sayings to Hillel and Shammai to make it seem like that Yeshua is following them, that, that Hillel and Shammai came first, their scenes, their rulings, and that Yeshua is playing off of them rather than what I believe is the truth, is the later rabbis are playing off of the sayings of Yeshua and attributing them to Hillel and Shammai. So this is very problematic, okay? And even Talmudic scholars fully admit that the whole compilation of the Mishnah and, you know, the Gemara and, you know, the Talmud in general is a later work. And it's not, uh, cannot be confidently attributed, contributed back to the first century. It is later work. So uh, it, it, just it, to bring develops a, it develops a critical mass of thought process to people and it, it develops its own its own kind of a core belief but really what we need to do always is go back to scripture right and, and if anything conflicts with the written torah we have to set the whatever else aside it doesn't matter i mean i've got to be a purist on that point yep and i've had to lay down traditions that i've held all my life and i've had to lay them down reluctantly because I have to believe in in the word that God gave us. Yeah. I have found that I have found that an understanding that there were oral Torahs of the day, as as you know, when we use that term halakha, that the term wasn't even there in the first century. So I'm using that term because it's what people know. Mm -hmm. In the Bible, it's just man's traditions. In the first century, they just would have called it traditions um or you know, an oral tradition or so forth. That's what they would have called it. And that's what we see Yeshua battling. We don't see Yeshua battling the Torah. We don't see Paul battling the Torah. What you are going to see both of them doing is battling the oral traditions of the day. And the minute you understand that, you can rightfully divide the word of truth. You can rightfully walk through and see the maintaining of the Torah throughout the whole Bible, both in the both in the um, Hebrew scriptures and in the apostolic scriptures. There's never a doing away of the Torah because it is the laws of the kingdom. So um, when you don't understand that, then you begin to just totally create two different religions. You get Paul being schizophrenic or we have a schizophrenic, you know, Adonai. So it just becomes very problematic, which is why you have so many Christian doctrines today, it just continues to split, right? Along with what you said, Tony, uh, this is something that um, 
had to do a little research. It looks like Shaul took the uh, position of, of rabbis stated later in the Gemara. And so this is from Torah Shebe al Peh, that it is forbidden to write down oral Torah. I'm not what's I'm not sure what century that's from. Again, on uh, Gittin 16b, uh, Rabbi Yehuda B. Namani, public orator of um, our Simeon B. Lachish, said as follows. It is written, Shemot 34, the words which are written down you are not at liberty to say by heart. And the words transmitted orally you are not at liberty to recite from writing. So these are earlier beliefs of the rabbis that like you said, predated the oral halakha. The final one uh, from the yeshiva of Arishmael, it said, it is written, you may write, but you may not write halakha. You know, when did that change? <laughs> when did oral Torah become written and supersede the word, the word of God, the written Torah? When did that happen? Yeah question for we need to all study and figure that out and and that's largely due to the fact that it was never supposed to be um permanently fixed mm -hmm. the oral traditions of the day were supposed to be there was allowance for adjustment throughout the generations because things were going to change technology would change things you know your living situation you're under roman rule you're not under roman rule you know, this, that, and another. Oral traditions were not supposed to be written down because they are flexible, which is why you don't have one oral Torah like they try to uh, portray that from the Talmud, right? Um, there's just so many problems with that. It was never supposed to be fixed, but adjustable. Then you got which Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud or the Jerusalem Talmud? Right. <laughs> Ashkenazi, Sephardic. I mean, you know... Exactly. We can we can um, we can uh, give Christianity a hard time for having you know hundreds if not thousands of denominations, but Judaism has numerous types of Judaisms even today, right? So just like um, Dr. Abramson said, you know, basically the followers of Yeshua were a sect of Judaism within the Judaisms of the day, and whether they were accepted or not accepted, that that was people's opinion. Yes. Different, different communities had different opinions about them. That's why it's all the way into the second century that we see that they finally make the cut. They finally say, that's it. No more allowing them in the synagogue. Because different communities were allowing them in. Mm -hmm. you know, because they were following Torah. So, um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll get back to the video because he gets into that a little bit more. And also, everyone, we're going to start moving a little bit faster through the video. Uh, now we're going to... <clears throat> start uh, bringing it up to certain points. Um, but I think you guys are getting the gist of what we wanted you to get here in the beginning. Who kind of duly noted the teachings of his uh, rabbis and, you know, went along with them and things like that. He fought against many of the teachings of the rabbis uh, and he felt that, you know, more should be done to change the status quo. Uh, things like his uh, tendency to be a great populist, like he used to hang out with the, you know, less um, desirable members of society, prostitutes, criminals, thieves, and so on. Uh, that was something that maybe the Pharisees were not doing quite as much, and he occupied that kind of margin of acceptability in the Pharisaic community. We don't know really very much about uh, what Jesus would have thought of Paul's you know, carrying forward of his mission, at least that is, uh, unless we want to take the Gospels at face value, which would not really be appropriate in a history lecture, nor in a young Israel, I think. But the, um, you know, it, it's very difficult for us to know what Jesus would have made of all this. He may have wanted to keep it entirely in the family forever, but that was not to be. The most all right, so we are at the next point here uh, that we wanted to, uh, you wanted to share, Steve. Yeah, I just thought of a, a verse here. So, it, you know, uh, Dr. Abraham said, we're not sure what Yeshua would have made of, of Shaul's carrying forward of Yeshua's mission. But it's quite clear. I mean, Yeshua, by his own uh, statement of purpose, he was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Um Maybe maybe you could look. I'm going to look up uh, Psalm 147. 
you just remember that verse here that talks about uh, the law was given. Let me. This is the last part of Jehelam 147, 19 and 20. He, God, reveals his words to Yaakov, his laws and rulings to Israel. He's not done this for other nations. They do not know his rulings. Okay. So there we go. The Torah is for the Jews, but it has to be shared with the nations. That's what Paul saw as his responsibility. So apparently, Shaul felt he was obeying Yeshua's call. He claimed to have a bot call on the, on the road to Damas Damascus. And he seems to accept that division of responsibility. What's your thoughts, Tony? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, that's... I mean that's that's the whole thing is he's staying in line with the with the teachings of Yeshua. So he gets his instructions obviously from Yeshua and he stays in line with it. He says, follow me as I follow Messiah. In other words, anything I do that is not lining up with Messiah's, you know, instructions and guidance and in, in walking in his kingdom, then don't follow me. But in all ways that I line up, you know, follow me as I follow Messiah. So yeah. I think it's important, um, you know, we see in his reading his um, writings that his his mission to the Gentiles is he's enlarging Israel. He's enlarging the kingdom because it was always supposed to include the Gentiles. So even like in Ephesians 2, where he says now we're part of the commonwealth of Israel, right? That commonwealth of Israel was not just a ethnic Israelite entity. It was to be of all nations. And then there's one Torah for all. Right. There's one Torah yeah. that, you know, was given at Sinai. There's one Torah that Yeshua followed and taught and everything Yeshua peeled back. When he peeled back the layers, he was peeling back the oral traditions so that you could see Torah for what it really was meant to be for all nations in that way. So, yeah. Well, one final one final. I just want to read another scripture here. This is quite a famous scripture for people who are reading the whole Bible. Um. But it's a little problematic. So here we are in John chapter 4. So Yeshua is addressing a woman who is part of the Goyim, a Samaritan woman, right? She's an outsider. And uh, so here we go in John 4.22. Yeshua is speaking. You people don't know what you're worshiping. We worship what we do know. For salvation comes from the Jews. That's a very problematic statement. I thought salvation came from the church. But Yeshua said it comes from the Jews. Okay. So it's obvious that Yeshua was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. There to be light to the nations. How do you take that passage, Tony? Absolutely. Yeah. It's it's through her covenants. It's through the fulfillment of her covenants. Um Yeshua came fulfilling the covenant. That word fulfill does not mean end. There's, it's a process of fulfilling. It's an on, In many cases, it's an on and unending fulfilling that goes on. Um, that's why we got to understand the context. So salvation is from the Jews. They are the carriers of the covenant. That's why we look at Romans 9. To them belongs the covenants, the promises, the temple the Torah and so forth. They they were the carriers. They were the responsibility. They they carry the oracles of Adonai, and so they had a certain responsibility. It didn't make them more saved than the Gentile or anything of the sort, more holy. But through their covenants, and that's what Yeshua was fulfilling. The blessing not only goes to ethnic Israel, but it goes to the nations. So I was asked the other day, Steve, because of circumcision and, you know, we're coming up on Passover and everything. I was asked, you know, press this question. As a Gentile, are you a member of the Abrahamic covenant? Are you a member of the, he was trying to, obviously he believes in circumcision after salvation for all Gentiles and so forth. And I told him, I said, I'm the fruit of the covenant of Abraham. The covenant of Abraham was given to his seed, his physical seed, to carry the promise. It's the sign of the promise. What matters is, am I the fruit of that promise? Am I receiving the blessing from which that promise was made to by, um, by Adonai to Abraham? And I am receiving it through faith in Yeshua. And so I am the fruit of that. But no, the, the Jewish people, the ethnic Jewish people, 
were called to carry the covenants. And the sign was circumcision, that they were the carriers of it. That's right. Amen. That's good. All right, everyone. So here's our next clip. Their source for this, but the Jews gathered there, said they wanted Barabbas to be released and that Jesus could be crucified. And when Pontius Pilate asked for a confirmation, they said, very important passage in the Gospel according to Matthew, his blood be on us and upon our children, which for centuries has been interpreted by no friends of the Jews to mean that uh, all Jews for all time accepted responsibility for the death of Jesus. His blood be on us and on our children. Most scholars believe that this phrase was actually written shortly after the destruction of the temple and it was written in a sense that it was proving the reason for the destruction of the temple was the rejection of Jesus and that the author did not mean, mean all Jews like meaning us uh, included within that statement but nevertheless it's an open-ended statement that has been so interpreted. All right, Brother Steve. Okay, that is a very critical juncture that we need to understand and comment on. I agree with what Dr. Abramson has said. And it's very unfortunate. It, 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 I lament that the anti-Jewish rhetoric um, for the last 2,000 years, rhetoric and, and theology and pogroms and, you know, violent, uh, you know, mass murders, you know, escalating into the Holocaust. And even today we see that. So the Jewish leaders during this time in history, you were talking about, you know, around the time of Yeshua's crucifixion, 33 CE, the uh, Prushim and the Sudikim sects, they escalated Yeshua's punishment to the Roman authorities. They couldn't kill him. They had to have the Romans do it. However, to refute anti-Semitic arguments, this does not make all Jews guilty by association. We need to understand According to the historical document or account in Matthew uh, 26, 25, we take the Jews in this passage to be specifically the mob present during the public address of Pilate and the nighttime kangaroo court convened by the Sanhedrin. Uh, if this public statement is historically correct, the fact remains that it's impossible to legally and spiritually impute guilt to all Jews at all times. Uh, book of Mishlei 26, chapter 26, verse 2 says, as the the, sipor, the, uh, the sparrow and its fluttering, as the swallow and its flying, so the kela, the curse will not will not alight. The curse will not land. Okay. According to the writings of uh, Shaul and the gospel accounts, the culpability for the death of Yeshua extends to all mankind. This problem for Sheol seems to be resolved as he recalls Yeshua's claim to be the sacrifice for all sins. In the larger picture, uh, Sheol presents legal arguments that all mankind is guilty of sin. I mean, that's that common knowledge, okay? He didn't need to say it, but we know that. And through Israel, all are capable of teshuvah and redemption. So, you know, Dr. Abramson, is, he's accurate in his presentation. It's just a snippet of the anti-Jewish mentality that's been presented through Christian doctrine through the centuries. And, you know, somebody coined that word, uh, the Christ killers. I, I think you mentioned that the other day, Tony. Yep. Very unfortunate, but that's that's taken root. I mean, I talked to an anti-Semite the other day. People don't realize it. You know, the, the, the Jews killed one of their own, well... Okay, it's unfortunate how the theology has taken a grip like that. And so it's it's very convenient that now you could classify them as Christ killers, marginalize them and say they are not the recipients of God's promise anymore. We are now as a church going to usurp the promises. And that's rubbish. Right. That's replacement theology and we need to understand that. Yeah. Amen. We know that Yeshua said, no one takes my life. I lay it down and I raise it up again. We know that the father sent his son to die. So this is all under, you know, the divine decree of, you know, Adonai. This is what he ordained to happen. And, you know, he died for all mankind. <clears throat> and, you know, we just know that Yeshua, uh, whoever was standing there, 
it's the evil hearts of men that was working, right? We know that even today, you know, leadership, let me put it to you this way. There's, there's a couple different judgments that you're going to see throughout the Bible. Sometimes there's judgment coming upon a nation as a whole because of the leadership and the wickedness of the leadership. But that doesn't leave each and every individual guilty of their sins. But Adonai is judging the nation as a whole, and he's scattering his people. But there's always a remnant of true faithful followers. Just like today in America, the way that today's um, administration is operating People around the world are saying, well, Americans believe this, and Americans are doing that, and look at what the Americans are doing. Well, not all of us agree with the administration. We're not all behind what's going on and what's being said, and that's throughout every administration, not just this one, but anyone. Not all Americans agreed all the time on what their administration is doing. Mm -hmm. We have to take that into account. And then finally, the promises to Abraham were not dependent on the faithfulness of Israel, their faithfulness. It's on the faithfulness of Adonai. And so them remaining a nation, remaining his bride, remaining his firstborn, there's nothing Israel can do to ever cast that away to where that is permanently cast away. It is up to the faithfulness of Adonai to fulfill his promises, not man. So replacement theology has done horrendous things to the Bible, to Scripture, and to the Jewish people. A lot of times, I if I need to remind myself, I walk outside at night and I look up and I see, hey, the moon's still up there. The sun came up today. And we look at Yirmiyahu chapter 31 and 33. Those are living witnesses, signs every day and every night that his promise to his, promises to Israel will never stop. They're eternal. Right. Right. The nations are going to fall. I mean, someday, you know, America, the way we're going, we're like the last days of the Roman Empire right now. Yep. So that, that's, you know, that, that's, you can expect that. But the Jewish people, never. Yep. <laughs> Lord's going to, he's, like you said, he's going to carry on his promises to them. Yep. There is no promise. I'm sorry, there's no um Scripture in the Hebrew Scriptures that ever says Israel be, will be cast away permanently, that there will be something called the church that will rise up and be the new people of Adonai. You know what I mean? Nowhere is that prophesied in any of the... You have to throw out the Hebrew Scriptures to get your theology for supersessionism. Yes. What, what they're actually following, Steve, is Martian's doctrine. Martian is the one from the 150s who came up, obviously he was later uh, deemed a heretic, but they never fully got rid of his writings out of their hearts because they maintain that the God of the old covenant is not the same God of the new covenant. And that split, that schizophrenic split still exists today in people's hearts. Um, yes. and so we call it the spirit of Martian. It's yeah. still around within Western Christianity today. We need to understand the father's heart that he treats Israel as his son. He chastises them in hopes of their repentance. And they do. And there's always a remnant, like you said, that repent. And that's his whole heart as a father. He's never going to discard them. Right. But he does allow them to be judged and, and give them a chance to make teshuvah and repent. And that's that's the good. That's the good that comes from the covenant. Amen. All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and fast forward this to the next clip. I turn because we have to talk about Paul some more. So uh, his great conversionary experience has become proverbial in English culture, English literature. Uh, while traveling on the road to Damascus, he receives a vision of Jesus. By the way, up until this point, he was a fanatical, self-described fanatical persecutor of Christians. Uh, and that at every turn, he was, you know, enforcing bans and trying very hard to uh, get them to change their ways. It is quite ironic to note that of all the apostles, Paul was clearly the most influential, and he was the only one never to meet Jesus alive. So the only encounter he had with Jesus was here on the road to Damascus. Jesus appears to him in a vision. If I'm not mistaken, I don't know my New Testament that well. Um, I think it was after Jesus was already crucified. I guess it was. So he's not only 
not there, he's not alive either, but he has this amazing encounter with Jesus. Um, he is blinded for three days. He can't see. He gropes his way into Damascus, and there he is healed, and his life is like completely dramatically changed on that road to Damascus. And he begins proselytizing for the church, for Christianity. Uh, he goes into synagogues where he'll get his most receptive audience. He thinks this is a Jewish thing. We'll go to Jews. We'll tell them, was tutzach, and Jews are not buying it, and Jews are rejecting him and giving him really a lot of grief over his message, kicking him out of the city. All right, Brother Steve. Okay. okay. I'll try to make this quick. <laughs> this is important. So, uh, Shaul records his bat kol, the voice from heaven, as, as uh, this is what Dr. Abramson calls a conversionary experience. Okay, so Shaul is marginalized by this famous Damascus Road experience. It's recorded in Acts uh, 9, verses 3 through 19. So in Christian doctrine, this is undoubtedly the most misinterpreted event of Shaul's life. It's used as a theological pivot, which promotes the false concept of his conversion. He didn't convert to anything. He didn't proselytize for the church. So, you know, Apostle Kifa wrote that Shaul's letters contain some things that are hard to understand, things which the uninstructed and the unstable distort to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You know, really, Kifa is talking about Christian doctrines. They distorted what Paul is and what he believed. As we talked about, like Tony said, a broken record. Shaul was born and lived as a Jew. He died as a Jew. There's no evidence in the gospel writings nor historical documents of any conversion to a different religion. Yep. It was always a pursuit by his own declaration. However, after the Damasic Road uh, experience, he no longer functioned as the uh, Torah enforcement agent, as the Mossad or the Prashim. His behavior changed from combative to instructive. So, you know, use Shammai and Hillel for a minute. Before the incident, you might say, you might say that uh, Shaul embodied more of a Shammai stance, whereas afterward he could be more in line with Hillel. So it was a course correction, period. I'm done. <laughs> Amen. Again, what the battle is, why people are not liking Paul, is not to do with the Torah or to do with his view of Messiah, because they couldn't argue against the fact, but it has to do with all these Gentiles coming in. How are they coming in? Well, the only means in the first century that you could be considered a full-fledged member is by proselytizing to becoming a Jew. You had to go through their system, and then obviously the last thing is a mikvah, and then circumcision um, to finalize everything. And then you were, you were like a born Jew now, and that's not found in the Torah. This is the oral um, traditions of the day, and this is what they did not like. They weren't going to put up with. There's no way we're letting those Gentile sinners into our synagogues uncircumcised or you know at least part of our community. Um, you know they did have God fears back then, which went to synagogue, which were uncircumcised Gentiles. Uh, but they weren't considered full-fledged members because they hadn't proselytized all the way. So mm -hmm. Paul is just letting these letting these Gentiles come in by faith. That is a problem. That is a huge problem on why he is being pushed around and sent away. I mean, obviously in Acts chapter 21, Yaakov says, look, there are tens of thousands of Jews that are believing in Yeshua who are all zealous for the Torah but they hear you teach to no longer circumcise their children anymore. I mean, they're getting these false reports about Paul. That's why they hate him so much. And that's why they're not adhering to his message. Um, they're not understanding his message. And so, yeah, he's got to do some things. Yaakov gives them the instructions to do so that everyone will know that Paul follows the Torah. And all the things that are spoken about him are not true. And Paul follows through with it. Right. So, uh, yeah, there's just major problems, both on the Orthodox Jewish side and Western Christianity, of understanding Paul, even to this day. 
synagogue, something that would happen to him over and over and over again during his career. Nevertheless, he is not uh, perturbed by that initial repudiation by the Jewish community, and he goes on a massive campaign to spread Christianity. It looks like this. You can see that from his origins here, here's his first ministry out here in Damascus, he's traveling all over the western half of the uh, the Roman Empire, sorry, the eastern half of the Roman Empire. Um, he's going through all through. All right, let's go ahead and move forward a little bit. I got my timestamp wrong here, so let's move forward. Yeah, that was good. Though. All right, here we go. For granted that Jesus existed. Oh, it's most likely that Jesus existed. Yes. Aren't there arguments that Jesus mentioned in the Talmud is not really good? Oh. Yes, you're absolutely right. So the, um, the, it's quite likely, I think, far, the historical evidence, although we don't have any direct you know, documents from the period, that Jesus did exist. There's simply too much evidence to suggest he didn't. Uh, did he say exactly those things that are in the Christian Testament? That's difficult. And was he the same Jesus that's mentioned in the Talmud? That's a huge question. And it, well, actually, we'll talk about that later this year when we look at Nachmanides, because one of Nachmanides' most brilliant defenses when he was charged in a disputation that the Talmud um, defames Jesus, uh, he said, what, that Jesus? That's a different Jesus altogether. You know, and... Brother Steve? Okay, yeah, this is so a couple of, couple of points here. So right there, I think they're referring to um, Yeshua bin Parakia. And there was a lot of Yeshua. I mean, Yeshua was like John, like the, the name Miller, you know, it's very common. Okay, so, uh, you know, Rabbi Abramson mentioned a minute ago that Shaul went on a massive campaign to spread Christianity. No, he's not teaching a newly minted religion. He's teaching Torah. Right. Okay, but he cut ties with the Sanhedrin as a persecutor of the Nazaratim, so he lost the Mossad as proponents, and instead he incurred their wrath. So he was a he was cut off as a traitor. Okay, so in, you know, back to what uh, Rabbi Abramson said. Yeah, it's likely uh, Yeshua existed. Okay, you know, we that's really outside of this discussion, but they they, they talked about it. There, there were several contenders for Mashiach, and there were many people named Yeshua. So we can we can move on to the next clip. Amen. Yeah, I mean, you know, Western Christianity often tries to portray as that there were no other claims of someone being Messiah except for Yeshua. No, there were all kinds of people back then. That's that's why they constantly challenge Yeshua, because he was one of many yes. that were people were claiming to be the Messiah. So um and yeah, the idea that Yeshua never existed, that's totally nonsense. Um, you know, if the writings that we have and the Gospels and everything are the most attested proof of any character in history, um, if you don't think Yeshua existed, then you can't prove, you can't prove Alexander the Great existed. You can't prove many of those characters um, of ancient times existed if you're going to deny that Yeshua existed. So it's just nonsense. All right, let's move to the next clip. Evaluate those. So I kind of skip over them. Also, we got to talk about Paul anyways. Talking about Jesus is a little too controversial, I think. Paul is controversial enough. So what about this issue of Paul and the Torah? So I've mentioned already that he has uh, this... It's always translated as nomos, as the law. So when he's talking Torah, he's talking the law. And it sounds like the rules, the rules. I really got to figure out about the rules. Are the rules important to me? And it's not clear exactly what Paul's position is on it. Uh, there's no question he's obsessed with it. A recent calculation indicated that 60% of the references to the word Torah, or law, in the Christian scripture are from Paul. And that's over 200 references. He's really talking about it a lot. Um, but he seems to be of two minds as to what exactly to do with it. Uh, he never says, you know, throw it out the window. He never says observe it completely. And he seems to have, you know, a, a, a conflicted attitude about not only what should Gentiles do, but what should Jews do, Jewish Christians. So, for example, there was uh, this. All right, Paul has no conflict with the Torah, everyone. 
His conflict is with how do I now line up everything with the oral traditions of the day? The oral traditions are not lining up with Torah. And so that is the conflict. That is the wrestling match. There is no dispute with Paul and Torah, and that Torah is both for the Gentile and the Jew. But now how are we going to live together in harmony because we've got these oral traditions, these walls that keep the Gentile out? It doesn't freely allow the Gentile to come in. What are we going to do? Well, Yeshua knocked down those walls, but he did knock down the Torah. Brother Steve? Well, something we need to also question. So Shaul was very conversant with the whole Greek culture. You know, he, he could walk into Athens, Greece and converse right. with those people. He could walk. So, but who did Shaul study under, Tori, uh, Tony? Who did, who was his teacher? Yeah, Gamaliel. Yeah. So that was his teacher. Okay. So now this, this whole passage right here, I just want to mention. So Navi Yeshiahu, uh, Isaiah 42. Uh, chapter 42, verses 1 through 4, uh, actually 1 through 7. Let me, I just need to read this because this is something that is like a critical uh, foundational point for Shaul's teaching, taking Torah to the nations. Okay. So if we can understand these pronouns as describing Israel, that's one interpretation. We can understand the methodology of Shaul. Let me read it very quickly. I'll start with verse one, go through seven. Here's my servant whom I support, my chosen one in whom I take pleasure. I put my spirit on him. He will bring justice to the nations. He will not cry out or shout. No one will hear his voice in the streets. He will not snap off a broken reed or snuff out a smoldering wick. He will bring forth justice according to truth. He will not weaken or be crushed until he establishes justice on the earth and the coastlands wait for his Torah. I, Adonai, called you righteous, that I took hold of you by the hand. I shaped you and made you a covenant for the people to be a light for the nation so that you can open blind eyes, free the prisoners from confinement, those living in darkness from a dungeon. So that, that whole principle is bringing light to the nations who were previously devoid of the law. Uh, so, you know, in, in Shaul's lifetime, there were two prominent centers of human thought. You had Athens, Greece, Jerusalem, Israel. Athens was the center of polytheistic and humanistic philosophy, whereas uh, Yerushalayim was the center point of God's glory. The, the Beit HaMikdash and the Kohanim as the custodians of God's revealed laws for mankind. Amen. Shaul knew that. Okay, I'm, I'm done with my comments there. Amen. No, I fully agree, brother. All right, let's move on to the next clip. <clears throat> so-called incident incident at Antioch where he had a really you know a knockdown drag out fight with one other apostle Peter uh, over Kashrut uh, because Peter was uh, and we only have Paul's account we only have his side of the story we don't know what what Peter would have to say about the argument but uh, uh, Peter was apparently according to Paul's account he was not happy about sharing a meal with uh, Gentile Christians because they didn't keep kosher. So, you know, what does that mean? It appears that Paul was saying to Peter, hey, if you're in, you're in whole hog, so to speak, I guess. <laughs> you say, if you're, if you're going to go with this new teaching of Jesus in which the commandments are not binding, at least on Gentiles, then certainly you should go have chicken parmesan at your Christian Gentile. I mean, remember, everything is very much predicated on is Christianity a, an ethnic faith, kind of like Judaism has a biological. All right. So, uh, Dr. <laughs> um, Abramson here, he takes the Western Christian, he believes it, right? Um, and actually, this is a wrong interpretation of the event. When Paul is addressing um, Peter in Galatians, it does not have to do with kosher eating at all. There's nothing about kosher eating. Why is he pulling away from eating with Gentiles? Because they're not circumcised. It's the circumcision party that's coming down. And within the first century, we know, you can just go to Acts chapter 10, where Paul says to the house of Cornelius, I know I shouldn't be here right now. You know that Jews don't associate 
with Gentiles, meaning we don't come into your houses, we don't eat with you because you guys are defiled. You're not, you have not been circumcised, you have not come into our ways fully. And so we don't even have table fellowship with you. You know, you guys remember when Yeshua, when the, um, the, uh, he was going to, he healed the uh, centurion servant and so forth. And, uh, you know, Yeshua said, hey, I'm going to go to your house and I'm paraphrasing, you know, take me to your house. I'm going to go and I'll heal. And uh, the centurion or the servant of the centurion said, no, no, don't come back to our house. No, just your word enough will heal the person, my servant or whatnot. And so they they knew that Jews were not permitted to come into the house at that time. But that's an oral tradition that's found nowhere in the Torah. So, no, it had nothing to do with kosher eating. It had to do with the oral traditions, why Paul was backing away. Yeah. Excuse me, Tony. I need I need to order a cheeseburger. It's about lunchtime. <laughs> You're right. okay, okay, so so excuse me for noticing the obvious. I mean, I obviously disagree with Dr. Abramson here. I, but the obvious thing is this discussion had nothing to do with cash root. So that subject was redundant. It needed no further elucidation. Okay, the subject on which Paul admonished Kepa was regarding halakha. So Kepa was a little bit intimidated. He was acting out of, you know, a little, he's a little bit scared. Shao had explained to him that uh, there were, Torah had no prohibitions of eating with Goim. There were none. <laughs> I think you may have already said that. Right. So Shao challenged Kepa on the basis of Torah not the basis of the Prushim Halcha. Right. This, of course, placed Shaul in an adversarial position with some of his brethren inside the Prushim sect. Amen. All right, we're going to move forward to uh, uh, timestamp 39. Best to follow these tasks, and that's how you'll be evaluated. The criteria is in the Torah. These are the mitzvos. Um, and uh, he seems to indicate that that's not at all what is relevant. So he seems to be, as a whole, rather conflicted about what to do with the law. Perhaps more significantly than this, or what this leads to, is a question of what do we do with all of those passages in the Jewish Bible which refer to the so-called election of Israel. The term election is a technical term meaning that the, the Jews somehow get most favored nation status. Right, that's a useful thing. Most favored nation status. Uh, they're called the, uh, the chosen people, the Amsegula, the Mamlechet Kohanim, things like this. These are like positive terms. Um, and what does that mean if now this Judaic idea through Jesus is somehow spread to the larger world as a whole? What happens to that election of Israel? And it's a question that not only bothered Paul, it bothered his would-be followers who were saying, well, what role do we have to play in this eschatological vision that you're playing out here? Where are, what are we supposed to do? Where do we fit in? Ah, Ms. Abramson, ready for a brilliant question. All right, Brother Steve. Okay, so Dr. Abramson says, you know, what, what is Shaul's thought? What about the passages that declare the election of Israel as the most favored nation status? They're separated as God's chosen people out of the 70 nations. So what happens to the election of Israel? Nothing changes. It, nothing, it, it doesn't change. I mean, that's going to be the last nation standing. That can't ever change. The election of Israel stands forever. So Adonai unequivocally declared Ben Israel to be his chosen people. Church doctrine to the contrary, regardless, period. I mean... That's the only hope for the world is through right. Israel. Right. We must remember that the commands through the entire Tanakh stating that Israel is to be light to the nations and Israel is the custodian of Torah. It's the only avenue through which people of all nations can be saved. This was central to Shaul's message. Yeah, I think the other question that uh, the rabbi mentioned, what do the followers of Shaul play in this eschatological vision? So Western Christianity has gone astray by interpreting the teachings of Paul as supersessionist. They maintain a doctrinal illusion 
that they'll become the recipients of the promises while Israel is punished. That's dangerous. That's that's a lie. I mean, I can't I can't whitewash it in any other way. It's just dumb. It, it's no. a lie. It's going to lead people into deeper into the a lie. Yeah. No, Paul makes it very clear reading Romans 9 through 11. In case you guys think that uh, Israel has been utterly cast down, he says, God forbid, may it never be, right? Um, he also lets us know that it is the Gentiles that are grafted into the natural olive tree, not the other way around. The natural olive branches aren't grafted into some wild olive tree. It's not happened. That If it was replacement theology, then that would have been the picture that Paul would have had in Romans 11. It would have been a wild olive tree and the natural branches being grafted into it. But that's not the picture there. Wild olive branches grafted into the natural olive tree alongside natural olive branches. That's Israel. And so, yes, we're just seeing an expanding of the kingdom of Adonai, right? The Gentiles are the expansion. The, they are the kingdom of Israel. It's, it's the enlargement of Israel, which is what is happening. But unfortunately, through false doctrine, false teachers, it's been put in a reverse mode. And that's just simply not biblical, which is why there are so many problems with Western Christianity. We have to remember the large number of Western Christianity believes in supersessionism. Yes. Okay. It's well over 50%. Just if you hold to reform doctrine, reform theology, which is a large portion, which includes the Roman Catholic Church, which is the largest when it comes to supersessionism and replacement theology. And then you've got the reformers who still had held to replacement theology. So the large number of Western Christianity holds that they have replaced Israel. That's a huge problem. One thought just came to mind. Um, this has stuck with me my entire life since I started to read. You know, I used to read, I've read it my whole life, Psalm 119. It's one of those very cryptic messages that you know it's it's like um it's one of the most beautiful literary works of mankind psalm 119 but for many people it's obscured it's never talked about but the whole focus of psalm 119 so here's king david he's talking about this beautiful law that brings life this eternal law this righteous law and the more I read it, I thought, that's what we have available to us as Gentiles, Jews. Everybody gets that. It's, it's within our grasp. But to push that away and to say that law is done, there's no life. I, you know, I'd, I'd rather have the law that brings life. Amen. All right, so as we move forward a little bit more. Message that the church is regnant and the, 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 the synagogue is uh, repudiated. And this comes from this whole idea of the election that it seems to be the natural outgrowth of Paul's teachings. Yes, uh, Aliza, Ms. Abramson. Right. So, yeah, no, that's an, that's an excellent question. Did you have something you wanted to share, Steve? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so basically, the word election here is kind of a buzzword. It's almost like a code word. So, Rabbi Abramson says the election seems to be the natural outgrowth of Shaul's teaching. I disagree for this reason. The word election here is used as a synonym for replacement. This is an accurate assessment of, of the misconception held by both Orthodox Judaism and the Western Church in their view of Christianity. So election in this context is a humanistic judgment which involves elevating Christianity above Judaism as the rightful usurpers and inheritors of Abraham's covenant. This is not what Shaul taught. Right, right. Election is a choice made by God. It is. 
He never changes who his elect. All throughout the Bible, the elect is Israel. Mm -hmm. And what is Israel made up of? Israel is always made up of both Israelites and Gentiles. There's always permanent gers mm -hmm. uh, living within Israel as part of the covenant. And so when we talk about Israel um, and the kingdom of Israel and so forth, it always includes non-ethnic Israelites. They were free to come in by grace and become permanent dwellers there. We see them at Sinai. They leave Egypt with, um, with Moshe and go to Sinai, become part of the covenant there. All throughout history, we see that Adonai has love for the Gur that lives amongst Israel, that has dedicated their lives to him. Yes. So, yeah. Maybe so you can help me with a scripture reference, Tony. You'll, you'll probably recognize it. I mean, I'm just going to a little cl uh, clip here. It appears from the Christian Testament that uh, Shaul was intent on fulfilling, at least in his fear of influence, the mitzvot produced to become light to the nations. Oh, so here's the quote. But with respect to being chosen, they, the Jews, are loved for the patriarch's sake, for God's free gifts and his calling are irrevocable. And so election in this sense cannot be construed as a like a Calvinistic choice by the deity in heaven that is going to damn those and save those against our free will. Right. Well, well you're reading Romans chapter 11. Yep, you're reading yeah, okay. right there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, call, the gifts and calling of Israel are irrevocable. Irrevocable, yeah. Yes. Absolutely. All right, we're moving ahead a little bit more here. Some of his followers that he is persona non grata in Jerusalem. His, you know, he's been traveling all over Asia Minor, telling people uh, they should convert to Christianity, Jews and Gentiles alike. And when he comes to Yerushalayim, he's not going to be a popular figure. So uh, he nevertheless uh, goes to Jerusalem. Uh, he's apparently bringing some charitable funds there. And... Um, he is at some point so afraid of what might happen to him at the hands of the elders. Again, recall that he himself was a persecutor of Christians. Uh, he apparently turns himself over to the Romans for protective custody. Uh, he is then sent to Caesarea, uh, which had a Roman garrison, and he is uh, imprisoned there for two years awaiting trial. Uh, the trial was to be held, uh, and again, we're not clear on exactly what was the charges, but you can imagine in, in this period of time, sedition or incent incitement to rebellion, things like that, these are all kinds of charges going on. Uh, it looks like it's not going to go his way, so since he is a Roman citizen, he uh, demands the right to appeal his case directly to uh, the emperor, which is apparently... All right. So again, we, we constantly, like we said earlier, it's like a broken record. Paul continually gets pushed back on his ethnic uh, brothers and sisters, cousins, however you want to put it, that are not followers of Yeshua because he's coming against their oral law. And they held their oral traditions binding on the people. As it, I mean, that's the way they, that's the way they, um, they walked in Torah. The oral traditions was on equal ground as Torah. When you came against their oral traditions, you in their eyes, you came against Torah. So they're coming after Paul because he's coming against their oral traditions. And in Paul, the whole time, he's trying to say, hey, look, I mean, he can he can fight you in a, in a, in a court of law. I'm not violating the Torah. I'm not violating the Torah. I might be violating your tradition, but I'm not violating the Torah. That's why he keeps getting off scot-free. The, the accusations can't stick. They just don't stick against Paul. He, he outsmarts them. So, you know, Rabbi Abramson said that uh, Shaul turns himself over to the Roman authorities for safekeeping. Uh, not true. Shaul es escalated his case to the Roman emperor for a strategy to uh, gain time, travel, and reach a more diverse audience. So his goal was to teach the Gentiles, so his appeal to the emperor, therefore, appears to be a legal ploy to um, gain more time and teaching opportunities. He doesn't appear to be concerned about his own safety. He was resolute in his message, and he was not deterred by the possibility or probability of imprisonment, punishment, or death. He 
that was not his concern. Right. He, so he seemed to leverage the occasions of public oratory to his advantage to reach a wider audience, and he didn't want to sit quietly in jail, so he appealed to the emperor. That was his right as a Roman citizen. Amen. So that gave him opportunities for government-funded travel under Rustin, uh, Roman custody, and uh, while officially waiting trial. Amen. All right, moving forward again. Not so much for you know promoting Judaism, um, but nevertheless, his Jewish origins, his Jewish thought, and the Jewish context in which he worked was crucial for his later influence. Uh, given the kind of receding pacifistic nature of Jesus, who was a, definitely a charismatic and powerful Pharisaic teacher, uh, it's unlikely that Jesus' teachings really would have spread beyond the small environment of Jerusalem, were it not for the tremendous, prodigious efforts of someone like Paul, who took Jesus' story on the road and transformed it to a Gentile faith, meaning appealed to the Greeks and the Romans, saying this is something that would interest you. Um, and, but nevertheless, he had a long-standing conflict, internal conflict over what that meant for his his Judaic heritage, and he struggled all the time with this question, which really uh, is a question for the church, even today. Is it universalist or is it particularist? How can you maintain both of those things simultaneously? Uh, as All right, so this is our final clip um, for the day, everyone. And of course, I don't think he's, I don't think um, Dr. Amerson here has it right. I don't, I don't think Paul was conflicted at all. Um, he knew exactly the mission. The focus is the Abrahamic covenant. The blessing is supposed to go out from Israel to the nations. And what is holding that back? What are the walls holding that back from happening? The oral traditions of the day. The man-made laws that Israel built up that did not want them to come down. The non-followers of Yeshua dug their heels in and would not allow Paul to tear those walls down, even though Yeshua did. Yeshua tore down the divider wall between the Israelite and the Gentile. And what was that? The oral traditions. They were built to keep people out. The Gentile was to stay out, amen, and the Israelite was to stay in. And then later, you know, we know it gets reversed. Now the Gentiles will build up walls to keep the Israelite out. And they will create Western Christianity, which is not biblical Christianity. It's so, in my opinion, Steve, Western Christianity is post biblical. It's a post biblical um, entity that was created. Biblical Christianity is messianic in its core, it's Torah in its core, foundationally. And so, yeah. including both the Israelite and the Gentile. But Western Christianity is post-biblical doctrine. That's that's my. I well, I have a question for you, Tony. Do you think that Shaul, you know, he was maybe maybe considered the most prolific of the gospel writers, but him along with you, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Yochanan, um, do you think that any of those departed from using Torah as their central message? You mean in the first century? Yeah, I mean, when you read those books, do you think they departed from Torah and then founded a new a new religion? It that would be impossible because if the Torah, which you and I, you know, Hebrew scriptures, Tanakh, teach that Israel is the bride, and that the law of Moshe is the ketubah, the wedding contract with the bride and the husband, that never goes away. It never does, and the wedding contract made room for the Gentile to come in by grace and dwell with Israel. So the contract is never done away with. Yeah. So no, I mean, it is it is the two groups that get rid of the contract. The, the rabbinic Judaism um, of the day that held to the oral traditions and would carry on creating a whole different Judaism in the second century, not like the first century Judaism, but still holding to the, you know, 
to uh, their oral traditions, again, they're not abiding by the Ketubah, and neither are Western Christianity. They're div- they, they built up divider walls. And so, no, it, it remains. Israel is the bride. Israel has her covenant relationship with Adonai. And that covenant relationship is a blessing that goes out to all nations to invite them in to be part of the covenant. I mean, we could we could go on and on uh, about that. But, yeah, I think you summarize that very clearly. Amen. All right. So, everyone, in wrapping up this video here today, um, uh, I hope this was helpful to you, very informative to you. Uh, we definitely, from me and um, Brother Steve's stance, Orthodox Judaism following rabbinical Judaisms today, the Judaisms of today are not the first century Judaisms, okay? The Judaism that um, Dr. Um, Abramson follows is a post-Judaism of the first century. And so in many ways, they can't see Yeshua because of that Judaism. They can't see the truth behind Yeshua. The scales are in their eyes. They are, But Dr. Um, Abramson is still, he's called to come home. He's called to come back to uh, Israel and her true covenant with, uh, with Adonai. And it's a Torah observant covenant. And so we pray for him. We pray for those that follow in his ways and his teachings that they will be open to see Yeshua as it is. Yeshua is their savior. Yeshua is their Jewish Messiah um, as much as he is ours. And so, uh, you know, one day all of Israel will be saved. There's no doubt about it. All of Israel will be saved. But that doesn't mean every single Jewish person. No. One day, nationally, Israel will accept Yeshua as nationally they will accept him. And so then each individual that accepts Yeshua will come in. And I pray one day that uh, Dr. Abramson comes into the kingdom. He comes into the fold and accepts his Jewish Messiah. Amen. And realizes he doesn't have to abandon Torah to do so. That he can follow Torah. He may have to abandon some of the oral traditions, of course, but not Torah. Good. Brother Steve? Yeah, I agree. I totally, I'm on board with that. Amen. And we pray for our Western Christian friends. They have uh, the understanding that Yeshua is the only way. They have the understanding of his deity, that he is God and so forth. And so there are many good things in Western Christianity doctrine that are there. But of course, there are many things that are skewed, skewing you from the truth and walking in covenant relationship with Adonai. And with Yeshua, that that has been abandoned through replacement theology and so forth. So we pray for those also, that their eyes will be open. Our eyes were open as we sought Adonai, as we sought Yeshua. And man, if our eyes can be open, anybody's can be. <laughs> you know, um, I would encourage their, our, our brothers and sisters in the Western Christianity to look at, uh, read Psalm 119. Yep. When you read about the laws and the precepts and the on those, ask yourself, what are those? Yep. And then go to Exodus chapter 20, Deuteronomy chapter 5, look at Leviticus 23, and look at all those, all that God gave us to embrace, you know, to come into his embrace. It's amazing. So Amen. that's a that's a place of study we could go to. Amen. Hey, everyone. I was a lost drug addict coming out of, you know entrenched in Western Christianity and the Lord, you know, through me seeking him and asking for repentance and coming back to him, he put me on this road. He put me on this road to truth, um, a lost a drug addict coming back to the Lord who had abandoned the Lord many years ago, coming back. And then he puts me on this road of truth and then he takes the scales off of my eyes. And then we've got brother Steve here who has many generations of uh, pastors in his in his heritage and so forth, Western Christianity. And yet, as Steve sought the truth of the Bible, just wanting to know what is truth, the Lord showed him. The Lord showed him, this is truth, Steve. This is truth. And so it's it, it can happen for anybody. Yes. If, if you will just submit to the Lord and read the Bible for what it says. Understand covenants for what it says, and you will see that we are all one in Messiah, both the Israelite and the Gentile, and there's one Torah for all. 
one kingdom, one law, one spirit. Amen. One way of salvation by grace, not by works. That's right. But we are called to do good works. Just read Ephesians chapter two. Yes. Amen. <clears throat> All right, everyone. Well, until we meet again, shalom. Shalom. Thank you, Tony.